Corporate farming. What has caused corporate farming? Who is entering the corporate farming picture and vertical integration? What will it take to save the family farm system? These are some of the questions that will be answered on U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report presents corporate farming with special guest, Reverend Lester Moore, pastor of the Methodist Church at Corning, Iowa, and Lloyd Fairbanks, administrative assistant for the National Farmers Organization. Here to do the questioning for U.S. Farm Report is W.W. W. Butch Swaim, director of NFO Public Information. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to express our views on one of the great subjects of the day, corporate farming, and what has caused it and what has brought it about. And I know that these two gentlemen that we have today have studied this situation long and hard and what is bringing it about, uh, who's entering farming, corporate farming, and what it's going to take to solve the problem. So we're going to start right in with asking Mr. Fairbanks, our legislative representative and administrative assistant to our national president, uh, some questions about what has caused corporate farming to come about. Mr. Fairbanks. Well, but uh, one of the vacuums that has been created in uh, agriculture uh, by the low income of farmers and has allowed the corporate type uh, structures to come in is the income that farmers have received over the past few years. And here I have a chart that I would like to show the audience uh, where the investment in agriculture has been $269 billion in 1967. Now then, from this, uh, the farmers realized $428 million, a billion dollars gross from this investment. Now, and also they had an expenditure against this of $34.8 billion. Now then if you'll do a little calculation, you'll find that they had $8 billion left, net uh, income left before taxation after they had <coughs> uh, uh, from the products that they produced on their farm. Now I want you to understand that this is products that they produced on their farm and not government payments and the housing allowance and the food allowance and others that have been figured in as income uh, to farmers. Now again with a simple calculation and it's very simple you find out that the farmers only received three percent return on their investment. Now, how many farmers can pay the income or the investment they have today, the interest on it, at 6 to 8 percent or more, as they are having to today, for operating capital and also for their land investment and stay in business? So here right now is one of the reasons why. Farmers are leaving the farm at the rate of five, one every five minutes. They've done this since 1959 through 1967, Butch. And so this has left a quite a vacuum here for industry to get in. Doesn't that figure out 2,500 farms per week? That's right, Farmers Butch. per week are leaving the land, folks. Just think of that. 2,500 a week are leaving the farm. Now let's take a look at industry up here at the top of the card. Industry has an investment of $370 billion. That is just a third more than what uh, farmers have invested in their industry. Now, they made a profit of $92 billion. This is before taxes, and that profit before taxes. Now, if you do, again, a little simple calculation, you'll find that this is 25% return on their investment. Now, this is, uh, will point out to you that they have this income that they are charged off at about 70% on the in-tax returns that they have today, the corporate index return, 
about 70% of this is figured in as in uh, to our taxes. But they found that they can plow this into agriculture and they can save 70 cents on the dollar by plowing it into agriculture. Later on, also taking losses, continue to save this butch. And then later on, they also they can t return this back as a, a capital gains and only have paid 25 cents on the dollar then on their uh, income that they got from their conglomerate industry. In other words, what you pointed out, the low income received by the family farmer is forcing him out of business, while at the same time the corporate structure can take advantage as a tax write-off and grab agriculture almost for free without any money out of their pocket. Reverend, do you have some comment on this subject? Well, it seems to me that uh, from our point of view, our concern, of course, is what's happening to the farmer in uh, the rural areas of our country. But we need to also be thinking in terms of what kind of social readjustments have to be made as a result of this kind of a loss on the family farm. Uh, we're losing 2,500 uh, farmers a week, according to your figures. This means that we are losing the approximate uh, number of a full county seat town every week from our rural communities. Uh, if we're going to really face up to the realities of the problems that face us, then we must uh, recognize this problem and begin to deal with it, not only from its cost factor, but from its social cost factor. One other thing that pointed out by Mr. Fairbanks on this chart here, that corporations are going to get that profit when they get control of agriculture, and they're making over five times as much return on their investment should they apply that much to agriculture commodities. The food bill at the grocery store, folks, could conceivably go up at least five times what it is now. What would keep them from asking 25 cents for one potato and getting it if a few corporations get control. Think of that. Right, and which I also want to point out that the Council of Economic Advisors have pointed out that these conglomerates and uh, non-farm uh, uh, investors now have $26 billion of undivided uh, assets here that can be plowed into agriculture. You know, uh, I think one of the problems that we face in this matter is that there are so many people who are not aware that it is as drastic a problem as it is. Today in the United States, according to a statement made by Senator Metcalf just uh, a week or so ago, the average age of our farmers in the United States is 59. This means, frankly speaking, that we have less than seven years to solve the problem. Because once the farmers reach the age of 65, they're going to quit fighting the battle because they can retire on Social Security benefits, they can take their money out of agriculture, and when this happens, it's going to leave the big bulk of, uh, of land available for development on a commercial basis. I was talking with a friend of mine not too long ago, and he said, well, this is a great thing, because he said, here I am ready to retire. How am I going to get rid of my farm? We don't have any young people who are willing to come into farming today. Uh, and uh, the figures which we see in terms of age is... Uh, is a real problem. In one of the counties real close to mine, the average age of the farmers in that county, this is uh, young and old alike, the average age is 70. 70. Now you can see what this means in terms of, of the availability not only of land for corporation buying, but in terms of what happens uh, to community organizations, to community patterns, and in, in terms of uh, the future, it means that uh, the young people who should be out there becoming involved in the farm are no longer there. Reverend, we, we as NFO have talked about the corporate uh, farming, uh, getting into agriculture for some time. And by the way, uh, we had a very difficult task of trying to prove to the people in local areas that there was uh, uh, corporate agriculture entering. But today, we find from a survey in uh, the agriculture department that from 1960 through now, this has increased by 57%. With uh, This is a survey just in 22 states with 7 million acres that they have acquired. Now, every rural uh, town, businessman, uh, church leader, and farmer 
is in driving distance today of one of these torpid type farms. Lloyd, I believe that the 57 percent, 50 percent of all of them in business uh, have come about since 1960. This means that it's more than double, so it would be all up right. over 100 percent of what it was at that time. Now, Mr. Fairbanks, I think we should discuss who was entering general corporation farming. And in your opinion, why are corporations willing to put their money in when they get 25 percent in their corporate investment? The record shows that they, they get this much, uh, up to this much anyway. And why would they enter agriculture with this present time only making about 3 percent uh, return from marketing on their investment? Well, Butch, as I pointed out here earlier, that uh, they have about a 70 percent tax structure in corporations. And of course, in agriculture, they can plow this into agriculture, and they can uh, take this off as a tax write-off. And then, uh, in turn, after they do capitalize this and capital gains, they still only have to pay about 25 percent on it. So as long as they can take this on a write-off uh, this way, they don't have to make a profit in farming to still make a profit off of their industry because of this. But what you're saying is that uh, the corporations who are going into farming are using the tax write-off to save them tax dollars, right. and it costs me and you extra tax dollars to make up what they're making on agriculture while they're still destroying the family farm. That's right. And uh, furthermore, I'd like to say this, in my opinion, that they are trying to get control of the agricultural uh, industry. They've got control of all the other natural resources now, and, uh, and the land is one of the last, and I think they're out to get the land. Well, I think this is partly because there's only three regions in the world since 1960 that could feed themselves. This is Australia, New Zealand, and North America from the Mexican border on north. So there's no wonder that they're out trying to get control of American agriculture. And the results of a survey showed, of the tax surveys I'm talking about, that the higher profits the corporations made in their other business, the more they lost in agriculture, so it was definitely, according to Senator Metcalf, a cover-up on their part to get this done. Now let's discuss a little bit more about who's going into corporate farming. Well, of course, the chain stores for a number of years now have worked. And in 1964 already, at their convention in October, we have a report here, it was in, in 1964, in November, when this was written up in Survey's journal that their principal spokesman, who was vice president of the chain store organization, Clarence Adamy, he called for the abolishment of the family farm. He said, uh, uh, to make it right down, he said, I am opposed to the maintenance of the family farm. Folks, this didn't receive much coverage because the chain stores do lots of advertising in America. But there are many more besides this. But think of it. The chain store is calling for the abolishment of the family farm system in America. And it went on to say that from range to range, the chain stores seek control. And they met meaning from the range where the cattle are produced to the cook stove range. They want to control the whole thing. And other companies that would like to get in, other concerns are the big feed companies. The feed companies now have totally integrated, or almost totally so, uh, providing about 85% of the broilers. Uh, this is chickens, frying chickens. Of course, the price is low now, but the only reason they keep it low, in my honest opinion, is because they make their brags that they want to get control of the red meat business. If they get control of the red meat business, then the family farm's in a bad way. So, uh, Reverend, I know that, that uh, you see this taking part all over America. What's this going to do? And then there's a lot more. There, uh, some would like to see the government take control. Some would like to see others take control. And everybody is edging in on agriculture. They're trying their best now to, to get people on the streets of New York to buy cattle uh, so that they can write it off as a tax dodge. And the farmer don't have any tax to provide for. He doesn't make any money in the first place. You're out here in rural America. What's going to be the effect of this overall whole thing? This is one of the things that I talked about when I said that I I'm deeply concerned about the social effects of the loss of the family farm. I think it has some moral effects too, but I think in terms of the social problems that result, we see 
a corporation moving into a community, buying up the land, and then bypassing that community because it, it does not have to deal with the merchants on Main Street. As I've watched this operate, these corporation farms come in, and then they can say to the wholesaler, not to the retailer on the, on the Main Street, they can say to the wholesaler, you sell us at our price or we'll go somewhere else, and they can get their price. This means that we cut out the middleman. Now, there's a lot of people who don't like the middleman, but frankly speaking, the economic generation that comes about by the retailer on Main Street makes a great deal of difference in the total economic health of the United States. And once we permit this to be destroyed, which is exactly what's happening as we lose our family farms, then we will be dropping our generation factor economically. And this will create more problems in terms of how we're going to solve the problems of the slums in the city, how we're going to solve our welfare problems, what we're going to do in terms of poverty, what we're going to do in terms of housing, what we're going to do in terms of education. Because if we do not have the economic generation, we cannot uh, raise tax fund funds to support this kind of a, an enterprise. And as I've watched this happen, what we see in the small community is that when the commercial farmer comes in, he takes over because he doesn't have to worry about what happens in the local community. The commercial farmer uh, can see the educational facilities deteriorate. He can see the religious institutions disintegrate. He can see the social organizations evaporate. And he's not affected at all because he's not there. The investor uh, or his investment are just as good without any of these things in the community. Reverend, I'd like to uh, bear out what you're saying there in an illustration which is close to my home in Missouri. Uh, there a uh, lumberman was contacted by one of these corporate farms to draw up plans for his uh, barn. Well, uh, in a short time, why uh, uh, the lumberman wondered about what they were going to do on this. And the next thing he knew, though, this barn was in construction, but the lumber had been bought from a, one of the large cities at a uh, wholesale rate rather than buying it from the lumberman and were using his plans. And furthermore, on this same corporate farm, a huge trailer truck was uh, stuck one day, and they found on this that it was loaded with iron posts that had also been purchased, not in that rural community, but from a wholesaler from far away. Right from the factory, I believe, the right. steel posts were. Right. And this is what's taking place. So what you gentlemen are pointing out is that it's everybody's concern. Go ahead there, Reverend. Well, I was going to say, some people would say, then this proves that the corporation farm can operate more efficiently and uh, more cheaply. They can produce food more cheaply than you can on the, on the family farm. And, and I think it's important for us to say to people, these are factors which you have to take into consideration, of course. But once you allow a monopoly or large corporations to take over, uh, supply and demand isn't going to determine what price uh, uh, is going to be because they'll control supply and uh, they'll just uh, create their own demand and this will create their own price. They'll control it on both ends. Now, by the same token, the chain store could sell much cheaper than they do if they wanted to, but they don't want to. They don't choose to. They set the price on the farmer at a low price on the buying end and they set the price on the public and I'm telling you folks, if they controlled it all the way through, I want to repeat the statement that I made before. What would keep them from asking 25 cents for one potato and getting it? And if they're going to get the return that was pointed out that the average of industry gets, our food bill could be many, many times higher than it is now. So don't kid yourselves. Lloyd, do you have anything else to, to add at this point? Well, one thing about it, uh, you certainly do not find this interest, though, in the uh, corporate farming uh, by the people that are working there that you have in the family-type farm. So I think when it eventually gets down to a full corporate-type structure, you may not find this as quite as economical as you think it is. But they don't have to worry about whether they can produce it for less than the family-type farmer does or not. When they once get in control of the agricultural production and take it through a vertically integrated route, clear on to the consumer, then they can charge this cost of production off and get their profits, uh, uh, huge corporate profits, not the, the family-type farmer profits, 
that uh, they will want to realize on this, as Butch says, on the 25 cents for one potato. Now, I think this is an important matter because so many people get the idea that simply because you're a big business, you can operate more efficiently. But on the family type farm, if it rains on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, you can work Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and maybe Sunday to catch up. But on a corporation farm, if it rains Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the man's gonna work Friday and uh, Thursday and Friday, but they're gonna pay time and a half for Saturday and double time for Sunday, and this is gonna add to his costs all the way down the line. They may even have to pay him for those other days, too. Well, I, I'm, I'm in favor of organized labor on the farms, too. Reverend Moore, I know that You've done a lot of studying on this. In your opinion, what do we need to do about this whole thing? We've laid out the plan and what's happening. What do we need to do about it? Well, there are several things that can be done, I'm quite sure. Uh, certainly, we need to talk in terms of legislation to stop the tax write-off. But we ought to say to ourselves, why is it that it's worth saving? Why, what difference does it make whether or not the, the family farm stays in the American scene? Now, we have not had any real good studies done by our agricultural colleges in recent years, but uh, the Goldsmith study, which was authorized by the 79th Congress, uh, gave us some figures which, while they are still uh, old figures, they were pretty impressive. Uh, according to the Goldsmith report, the family farm, as over against corporation farming, and studied in two different uh, communities in California, showed some very interesting factors. For instance, the family farming community had twice as many churches as the corporation fa farming community. Its business generation was uh, 62 million to 35 million. Uh, almost double. Almost double. Its retail trade, 61% higher in the family farming community and in the corporation community. There were two newspapers as over against one in the corporation farming. And of course, we who in Iowa get used to uh, one large newspaper dominating us, we know how easy it is for that one newspaper to affect the thinking and the feeling of the people in that area. Uh, one of the most important factors, it seemed to me, was the schools. It was discovered that in the family farming community, not only did they have more schooling opportunity, but the uh, values and the uh, quality of education was much higher. There were four elementary schools and one high school in the farming community as over against one elementary school alone in the corporation farming community. And of course, democracy comes in here too, for in the family farming community, there were popular elections to make decisions in terms of community procedures, whereas in the corporation farming, uh, the corporate leaders did all the decision making. It seems to me that this is a good indication that the family farm does have some very important factors to give to, to our society and to our social structure. There are some people say, well, yes, but uh, we've, we've got progress. Automation brings new progress. And I submit that it's not progress to treat land as a mining operation. It's not progress to, to cut off our economic strength and bypass uh, uh, the community. It just doesn't seem to me to make any sense to call this progress. I don't think it's progress to force the relocation of rural citizens in, in urban areas and f give them uh, uh, nothing really to prepare them for this kind of life. And in a real sense, you rob them of their self-esteem, you depersonalize their lives, and you create more of the problems that we are now seeing as a great major urban crisis in America today. In other words, you create poverty faster than you can solve it with this method. Exactly. It doesn't seem to me that there's any sense at all in trying to replace the values and the strengths and the efficiency of the family farm with a depersonalized and what I feel to be an inefficient and socially destructive corporation farm. Well, there's nothing more efficient than the family farm uh, adequately, uh, of adequate size. Now, they've studied this year in and year out and a diversified farm, and there's nothing found more efficient. So if they're wanting efficiency, most certainly we should protect the family farm. Lloyd, you're spending a great deal of time in Washington. What seems to you to be the way that we can best deal with this problem? Well, Reverend, right now, I think you've uh, touched on it. I think uh, Senator Metcalf's bill is one that should be supported very strenuously. That's the tax write-off bill. Right. This is one. And, of course, I think uh, really you're going to have to bring it back to the states and uh, where the states like Kansas, Oklahoma, Minnesota, North Dakota have uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, tax laws there to where they can uh, keep these corporations from coming in in the large sizes uh, 
and even uh, entering the states in a lot of cases under their law uh, from getting started into agriculture. And of course, uh, of course, one that I feel that would slow down and keep uh, industry from getting into agriculture um, in the fast uh, pace that they are today, and that is to give the farmers a price along with the efficiency that he has. In other words, pay him for the efficiency that he right. does produce over the years. Right. And as Reverend pointed out here, I liked your term, mining the soil. Uh, what we've been doing in America is bleeding the United States of its natural resources at less than cost of production to the American farmer. And now they hope to bleed us of the last natural resource by shifting out the people. Mm -hmm. And this cannot continue and keep our economic society going and in balance. We've underpaid agriculture enough that we've had to have a debt-fueled economy to keep the thing going. And uh, with the tax dodge and the write-offs that they've given uh, different interests, I should say, some people call them selfish interests, but call them what you may, whether it's on purpose or whether it's accidental, we have, it amounts to the same thing, and we go down the road to the same point. And we must work together Everybody, as we pointed out here in this program, it's everybody's concern. You pointed out very aptly that the merchant out here in rural America has a stake. You pointed out, Lloyd, too, in your sighting of these things. So there's something in this for everybody. And if we're going to have a fully operating economy, we need the return, the turnover, the economic base that you talked about. We need this to keep the thing going. The family farm structure of agriculture has built the greatest nation on earth. And we did this by working together. The church, the country schools, the other schools, and all of society. Now, let's don't destroy what we've built. Uh, would you want to add something to this about uh, the great thing in America? Well, You've seen it grow for a long time. One you see the, it deteriorate at the present. One of the things that's bothered me, I think, is that we keep talking about the farm problem. In a nation that's been able to develop the kind of scientific know-how to send a man to the moon, ought to be able to find some kind of mines, or at least to use these great mines that we've got, to work on this problem. It seems to me that the time has now come when the problem is so severe that the American people are going to have to see this in terms of its total uh, growth. Right, and we're calling on all of America to get concerned now, and especially the farmers, to bargain together and sell together, because we know that better farm prices is a must to keep the family farm in business, and we know it's the greatest thing that could be brought about. Join the NFO and support our efforts. U.S. Farm Report has presented Corporate Farming, with special guest Reverend Lester Moore, pastor of the Methodist Church at Corning, Iowa and Lloyd Fairbanks, Administrative Assistant for the National Farmers Organization. Doing the questioning for U.S. Farm Report was W.W. W. Butt Swain, Director of NFO Public Information. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is a gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of agricultural producers. A brighter day for American agriculture.